Hi everyone. We're going to be taking up from where we left off in the last video, where we, we were talking about Hobbes' view of human nature and the nasty, brutish and short life that it leads to without uh, the government there to correct it. <clears throat> so, given the state of perpetual war that Hobbes sees as kind of the default settings of human life, how, how have we ever managed to make peace? How have we ever managed to build a civil society? And Hobbes' answer to that question is what he, he and many others have called the social contract. In order to spare themselves the state of nature, Hobbes believed all rational men will willingly sacrifice their liberties, they'll give up their natural rights in return for security and protection. People are born with rights. What do they have a right to? Well, everything. And so therefore, nothing. As I was saying in the last video, under purely natural conditions, I have a right to your shoes, you have a right to my wallet, she has a right to my car, he has a right to your wife, etc, etc. But the subject consents to give up these natural rights. And in Hobbes's word, be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow against himself. They do this for their own self-interest. If you come to think of it, asking, as we have been doing, are people basically selfish or are they basically cooperative, is a bit of a false dichotomy. Both can actually be true. People cooperate out of self-interest. They have a selfish need to cooperate with each other. They're cooperative because they're selfish or self-interested. Now, you could still argue that there is still something missing from this view of human association. This kind of, uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, quid pro quo view of human association. Perhaps it misses something doesn't account for pure altruism and absolute self-sacrifice, and you can find examples of these sometimes. You might be right for asking these questions, but for Hobbes, it was very much the same selfish instincts that led people to make peace, that led them to make war in the first place. It was just a slightly more enlightened form a slightly more prudent form of selfishness that leads them to sacrifice their freedoms and their natural rights and give up their equality, give up their equal status and, and submit themselves to a hierarchy. So each man in signing up to the social contract gives his rights away for his own benefit. But the social contract is meaningless if it's not enforced and this contract is in itself unenforceable without a supremely powerful third party, a king. Their contract is with each other, not with the king, but they're giving away their powers to the king, not to each other. They're saying, I'll give up my freedoms, I'll give my freedoms away to this guy, if you all do too. And that act of everybody agreeing to recognize one person as the single presiding power is what creates the state, what creates the commonwealth, as Hobbes calls it. He says the only way to erect such a common power is for men to confer all their power and strength upon one man or one assembly of men that may reduce all their wills by plurality of voices unto one will, in such manner as if every man should say to every man, I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man or to this assembly of men on this condition, that thou give up thy right to him and authorize all his actions in a like manner. This is the generation of that great Leviathan, or rather, speak more reverently of that mortal God to which we owe 
under the immortal God, our peace and defence. Sovereignty for Hobbes is an effect of the social contract and is in that way made by the people who are subjected to it. It's what the people do to the king rather than what the king does to the people. The commonwealth is generated from below. So despite being a, a theoretical justification of absolutist monarchy, it's actually at the same time a quasi-democratic theory. It's almost like the people are saying to the king, right, you're going to rule over us and control our lives because that's the only way I can ever live in peace and harmony with him, that other guy. They don't elect him into office, but they make him king simply by recognizing him as such and obeying him. Doesn't seem to be very important to Hobbes who the sovereign is. What is most important is that there is a sovereign and that he reigns absolutely and unchallenged. It's the office of the sovereign rather than the person of the sovereign that's important. The sovereign has an important job to do, and it should and will be done by the person who does this job most effectively. Hobbes's theory gives the king enormous amounts of power, but his theories wouldn't be all that flattering to any king. The king of England isn't God's gift to the England. He's just a guy. He's just a dude with a job to do. So you can perhaps see the kind of conversation Hobbes imagines people having at the dawn of civilization, the dawn of civil society. Everyone is in a state of nature and they're all busy beating each other up. And then at a certain point, perhaps fatigue sets in and they're all lying broken on the ground. And then one guy finally says, why are we doing this? Can we not just stop? Someone else agrees. He says, yeah, can we not just cooperate? Can we not just lay down our arms and stop fighting? So the first guy says, okay, let's do it, but you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. And someone steps in and says, I think we need to get one person to ensure we all stick to this social contract we've got going here. We've got to give him the power to enforce it. And then at that point, the yet-to-be sovereign comes along and he says, hi guys, how are things? How's life? And, and one guy says, life, I'll tell you how life is. Life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That's how life is. And he says, oh, oh, bummer. Well, what's the problem? And, and someone says, well, we're all free and equal, and we've got absolute rights to everything. And, and the yet-to-be-made sovereign says, oh, well, sounds good, No. And someone says, well, mm, not really. It's actually making us kind of miserable. And the proto-sovereign says, oh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. If, if only there was something I could do. And they say, well, well, maybe there is, you know. Maybe actually there is something you can do. Do you, do you see all these natural rights and freedoms we've got? Well... We're sort of wondering if maybe you wanted them. Yeah, we want you to have them. And he says, wow, suits me. When do I start? And at that point, they recognize him as king and he becomes sovereign. <laughs>